It is a high Sabbath today. Not only do we have a baptism, we're going to be calling uh, Chris up in just a second to um, um, introduce you. I mean, you've already met him, but you know, welcome him into the family of the Kanye West Seventh-day Adventist Church. But we have so many great visitors and family here today. It's so good to see all you guys. I'm just, all these people with Chris, it's good to see you guys. It's uh, Tiff, it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Everybody say happy birthday, Tiffany. Stop glaring at me. It's your birthday. You're allowed to be celebrated. Um, my favorite pastors in the world, Pastor Josie's here. Everybody say hi, Pastor Josie. She, uh, she's family, and so please make her feel well and special when she comes. And I want to tell you how, how, what a great, amazing friend and pastor she is. This is how spiritually insightful this woman is. She's staying with the Cybers, all right? Um, and at Jesse Seibel, he was getting up to go to Ka Kailua, and she says, oh, no, I have to go to God's house in Kanyoi. <laughs> so, so you all know how amazing that is for, um, for spiritual incitement and wisdom. Obviously, you're all here, so yeah, you understand that. Uh, so we thank you, Pastor Josie, for being here. She's um, on the mainland right now, but maybe one day we'll sneak her over here and never let her leave. Um, just, again... To my family, it's so good to see you. For those I didn't get to see last week, it was, been, uh, it was a month before I got to speak last week, and I felt like a caged tiger, uh, because bringing you the Word of God is my reason for living. And so I uh, thank you guys for letting me be here. But, 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 we're going to go to like four if I keep talking. So I want to invite um, a man who almost needs no introduction, because he's so big, whenever he walks, everybody goes, who's that? They go, it's Chris. So come on up, Chris. Uh, you probably first remember him or first remember seeing him when Sacha brought in, uh, came to the church. And usually she comes in with two very handsome young men, her sons. But like when she came in this time, the son like got blocked out for a little bit. <laughs> right? It was like, what, what is this shadow over here? Oh, it's Chris. It's oh, this is my friend Chris. And uh, quickly her friend Chris became her boyfriend Chris. And then none of us will forget that amazing Sabbath where um, I asked you to stay around just for a few moments because we had something special for you. And Chris came up and right here proposed to Sacha because he said he wanted her family to be part of it. And he recognized the importance of this family in her life. So it's amazing. Well, last week, last week, Chris has been working with us at our beginner's class and growing and, you know, just um, coming to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Chris says, hey, I'm ready. I'm all, okay, what are you ready for? Uh, coming over for lunch? What's this guy happening? He's all, no, next week. I'm getting baptized. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. I'll call Taj. He's like, no, no, no. I'm being baptized here with you. Yeah. I was mean, shocked because, you know, Sacha, you know, and her facilities. But, 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 but in fact, I drove up today and Taj was actually here in the parking lot. And I was like, oh, oh, I see. So I guess Taj is going to be doing the baptism today. That's great. But no, uh, Taj came uh, to wish Tiff a happy birthday and stick around to wish congratulations to um, Chris. Chris has read the charge. He's accepted all of the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And more important than all of that, he's accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he doesn't want another day to go by without letting the world know that he is God's and God is is his. And so, church, it is my privilege. And thank you for standing on the lower thing to make me feel better about myself. I saw Fertig's sermon recently where he brought this big guy up, and Fertig's like over here looking up at it. And like, but Chris is a man of honor. He, he stands down to let the pastor be all like, yes, thank you, my son. Um, we, are, we are so blessed to be enlarging our family today. Uh, Chris has always been part of the family from the moment he walked in the door, but he wanted to make it official. And so is there a motion? And I'm going to say this motion for this. Person. Oh, wait, no, she can't. That's right. Because it only has to come from a member of the church and she has yet to move her membership yet. So is there a motion from one of our members that we accept Chris? There's a second. All in favor say hallelujah. hallelujah. Any opposed, go home. No one's opposed. All right. Uh, and then tell Sacha, you're next. You're next. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, uh, this is a great day. And so um, 
As you know, they're going to get married, but Chris didn't want to enter the marriage unless they were equally yoked, unless they were on the same path together. And so I'm just, you know, I could, again, I'll be here till four if I keep talking. So I'm going to pray over you, Chris, and I'm going to let you go. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the decisions this man has made. We thank you for the fact that long before he even knew, you had already accepted him, you had drawn him in. And now, Lord, we make it official. Thank you, Father, for this moment. Thank you for guiding Chris and Sacha not only to be together, but to see that the only way they can stay together is to be in you. And so, Lord, we thank you for this right now. Amen. Love you, brother. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I was going to say pretend I'm Sacha, but don't do that. Just I'll give this to you. <laughs> From Kanye Oye Seventh-day Adventist Church. Aloha. <laughs> Woo! I feel good. How about you? Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Somebody rejoice with me. Come on. Yeah, let's do some rejoicing in the house of God. Yes! And be glad in it. Do I have any glad brothers and sisters in here today? All right, then. We have come to hear God speaking to us in this way. We are starting a series. Uh, we started last week on the names of God. Because to know God's name is to know how much he loves you. To know God's name is to know how much he loves you. And when we just call him God, we're missing out on so much depth that's there. Moses understood that. For Moses had spent over a month with God, he finally had the courage, uh, grew up the courage to say, God, sh tell me your name. And God knew exactly what he meant. He wanted a complete revelation of who he was. An intimate, uniting. And Moses, God's like, listen, I can't show you all of me because you will literally die. You will straight up be burned up in my glory. But I will give you as much as you can take. And God honored Moses' request. And Moses left the mountaintop glowing because he had been filled with the presence of God. I do not want anyone to leave today unless they are glowing. Because God's presence is in this place. And he wants to be in this place as well. So who is ready to allow God to come in and fill him and learn the aspects of his name? If you are, let me say amen. Let me hear you say amen. I ain't been gone that long, folks. We talk to each other here. Good to see the cooks here. I miss you guys. Mr. Smiles. Every time I start to feel good about my physical health, the cook walks in and I'm like, ugh. Maybe another 40 years. Anyway. I want you to, well, quick word on last week. Last week we, we discovered the first name of God that's revealed in the entire Bible. Is God the creator? He's Elohim. Everybody say Elohim. Elohim. He's a powerful God. He's the God who walked into a place that was darkness and was brokenness and was emptiness and he spoke. And light chased away the darkness. His spirit filled the emptiness and his purpose gave direction to the brokenness. And if he can do that to the earth, we know that Elohim can speak in our lives today and take our broken lives, our lives filled with darkness, our empty lives and fill them with his power because Elohim was the God of power he speaks and it happens he says it do you believe that God can speak power in your life right now yes. scratch that do you believe that God has spoken power into your lives yes, yes he has give God some glory yes. for what he's already done we know he will do it and we know that he is doing it because we are here, hearing his voice. Today we get to the second name of God. Where Elohim is the God of power. Oh, this next name. This next name. This is the, the name. It is the most used name for God in the entire Bible. We're going to find out why. It is, and it's funny because in spite of being the most used name for God in the Bible, nobody knows how to actually pronounce it correctly. 
Okay, there's been debate over the last 2,000, 3,000 years on exactly how to pronounce it. Why has there been debate? Because this name was so sacred that about 1,000 years ago, the Hebrews stopped saying it. They said, no, 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 I'm not going to say it anymore. In fact, before that, they, uh, when they wrote it, they only wrote four letters, Hebrew letters. They were Y, H, W, H. So they wrote it, but they would not speak it. And Y, H, W, H. The Greeks looked at it and said, it's Jehovah. Jehovah. Have you heard of Jehovah before? Well, as the Hebrews came in, they talked, they said, actually, it's closer to Yahweh. Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh. You see, when this name is, uh, according to the uh, experts, properly pronounced, it's as if uh, the sound of breathing in and out. We're about to find out why that is. Father in heaven, speak to us, Lord. Yahweh, come in this place and fill our hearts Feel our emptiness. Let us see your face. We ask this, Lord, not because we're worthy, but because we claim the name of Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we thank you for answering this prayer. Amen. Turn to Genesis, the second chapter. As you know, there are two creation stories in the Bible. There's the Elohim creation story, and there's the Yahweh creation story. The Elohim creation story is a story of us looking up to God. Okay, it's this relationship. He is above us, we are below him. But the Yahweh story, the Yahweh story is special. Let's read it. Genesis 2, and we're going to start in verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When, and this is the first time we hear the name, Yahweh. Whenever you see the word Lord in all capitals, that's Yahweh. That's Yahweh. It was so, again, special that they took out Yahweh uh, and they re, um, replaced it with um, the name Lord. Okay? But it's Yahweh. Whenever you see it, Yahweh. Lord in all capitals. When Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub in the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant in the field had yet sprung up, uh, for Yahweh God had not sent the rain on the earth, because there was no person to work the ground. There was no person to work the ground. But streams of water came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord God, Yahweh, formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Now then, Yahweh had planted a garden, a what church? In the east in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. Yahweh, the God of relationship. Everything about Yahweh is about relationship. When we first talked about, you know, the, um, well, in Elohim, he just speaks. The world pops up, okay? But the second, when we're talking about Yahweh, it says no plants had formed yet because man hadn't been there to take care of the ground. Then God made uh, plants come up because he was about to make man. Okay, what it's saying is there's a relationship aspect between man and the earth. Okay, a relationship. I'm not going to go into all that today, but I just want you to understand. We have a duty, according to the Bible, to care for the earth. Okay, there's a relationship aspect there. But the deeper relationship aspect comes when he forms man. Elohim says, let's make man in our own image. Male and female in our image, we'll make them both. But Yahweh says, this is how I want to make them. Where Elohim spoke and things appeared, said, let there be mountains, and boom, there's the Ko'olaus. Aren't they beautiful? Said, let there be an ocean, and boom, there's Kanyoe Bay. Ain't it beautiful? As long as it's not high tide and sewage is flowing in. Anyway. Yeah, it's beautiful. God speaks and beauty appears. Doesn't have to do anything except speak. But then he comes to man and he wants the universe to know that man is different. The way he relates to God is different than how even all nature relates to God. And so it says he gets into the dust and the mud and he forms man. And then in one of the most intimate acts in all the Bible, he gets face to face with what he has formed and he breathes into his nostrils 
himself. And man becomes a carrier of God. We were formed to be God's image. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. And the first thing man sees when he opens his eyes is the face of Yahweh smiling at him. Good morning. Your name's Adam. Good morning. Your name's Eve. Close your eyes, if you will, for half a second. Breathe in deeply. Now breathe out deeply. Breathe in. Breathe out. With every breath we take, God wants you to know that He is with you. He is present in this place. Feel His presence with you today. There are three things I want to talk about about this Yahweh, the God of the relationship. Being a God of the relationship, Yahweh is a God of priority. Everybody say priority. Being a God of the relationship means Yahweh is a God of belonging. Everybody say belonging. And being a God of the relationship means Yahweh is a God of the seeking. Everybody say seeking. Before we go on to the first point, a uh, story about relationships that I hope brings us all in. Man was walking out on a country road one day and he sees a farmer. And the farmer is kneeling down next to his tractor and he's singing a love song to it. And the man's like, Jeb, what you doing over there? And Jeb finishes singing the love song. Yeah. You are the light of my life. And I will never let you go. That's why Monty never asked me to sing up here. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeb comes over and says, well, I gotta be honest. Me and the missus are having some uh, marital problems. And so we went to see a therapist. And uh, she got up and stormed out of the office because I would never get it. And so I asked the therapist, well, what can I do to get her back? And he's like, well, sometimes you have to do something romantic to attract her. <laughs> See, unless we understand what God is saying to us, we're always going to be doing the wrong thing. That some of you will get it later. Attract her, attract her. <laughs> now nah, they got it. Okay. Um, First thing, God is a God of priority. Everybody say again, priority. Text is going to be Ephesians 3.17. Again, the first image we see is Yahweh making Adam and Eve different from the rest of creation. With hands in the mud and his breath in them, he sets the relational priority from the beginning. Just as man was an empty mud pile before God filled him with life, so we are empty without God's filling. We're empty without God's filling. See, the problem with the world today is that it is trying to put other relationships in priority over a relationship with God. Even good relationships. Okay? But God formed Adam first by himself so that Adam and him could have some time together. And then he separately goes and forms Eve by herself so they could have some time together. God is three in one. You could have had the Father working on one, the Son working on the other, and the Spirit breathing into both of them. And have them come up at the same time. But he wanted them to know your first Priority, your first relational priority needs to be with God. Needs to be with God. And then husband and wife. And then kids. And then your job. And then, and then, and then. But God first. It's been said by researchers. Not just by, you know, some dudes. But they've researched it. They say, you've heard this before. I'm just going to keep repeating it until we finally get it. That couples who read the Bible together regularly, who pray together regularly, and who attend church together regularly have a less than 1% divorce rate. But the same research shows us that the church has a higher divorce rate than the world does. So what's that telling us? 
that we've got a lot of people calling themselves Christians who have not set God as their priority. They're not worshiping together. They're not praying together. They're not reading the Bible together. They are apart. They call themselves Christians, but yet they are apart. And we are finding more and more and more families breaking up in the church. Third, fourth marriages. Because they're constantly chasing after other relationships. You will never fix your marriage by focusing on your marriage. You will never fix your kids by focusing on your kids. You will never fix your work situation and find joy in work by focusing on the job. But yet still we are running after the job, running after our kids, running after our spouses, and putting God somewhere on the back corner. God breathed into us first. And we are suffocating ourselves because we do not go to the source of life. Story I've told before, but so great here. Um, back in the 50s, uh, Arabs, uh, sheep, they just discovered oil and they started to become filthy rich. Decided to visit New York for the first time. Okay, they came over on the plane and they walked into a, their hotel room and they said, uh, excuse me, sir, where do I go to get the water? He's like, the water? is like, where? The well. He said, oh no, just went over to the sink and turned on the faucet and water, life-giving water comes flowing out from the faucet. And the sheik is, he's like, oh, this is amazing, it's a miracle. He's like, all the faucets do this? He's like, yeah, just turn it on. And the sheik just stood there watching the water flow because the only water in his part of the world is so precious, it's life. And so he went home and he said, I want to order 10,000 faucets, gold faucets. And 10,000 gold faucets came and he got them and he put it on the wall and he turned it and nothing happened because he didn't understand plumbing. He thought the faucet was some magical thing that if you turned it on, it would come out, but it was not connected to the source. True story. Not only is it a true story of what happened in the 50s, it's a true story of what's happening to us now. We've got 10,000 gold faucets in our life. But yet we're not connecting to the source. And letting Yahweh flow through us. You see, I said you can't solve any of those things by focusing on them. But, 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 and give me an amen if you found this to be true. If instead you focus on your relationship with God, you press close to Him, you fall on your knees, you lift Him up, then it doesn't matter what your relationship with your wife is like because He will fix it. It doesn't matter what your relationship with your kids are like, He will go to them. If you but make Him your priority, all these things will come after. Have you found that to be true? Well, then continue living it. See, the difference between the mud and the man was the breath of life. Was the breath of life. And we will not find the breath of life in our spouse. We will not find the breath of life in our kids. We will not find the breath of life in our family. We only find the breath of life in Yahweh. Hey. Ephesians 3 17 and 19 says this. We pray that out of the glorious riches you may be strengthened by the power through God's Spirit that is in your inner being, that flows within you, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you may be rooted. Somebody say rooted. rooted. And established. Somebody say established. established. In love. And what is love, everybody? God. God is love. Yahweh is love. That you may be rooted and established in love. That you may have the power together with all the saints who are connected with God to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love 
of Christ. And to know that this love surpasses knowledge. It surpasses everything that you may be filled to the measure with all of the fullness of God. When we focus on God who is love, we are filled. Otherwise, we suffocate. If you want to be filled with the love of God, say, fill me up, Lord. Then he will. Second point. Yahweh is a God of belonging. He's a God of belonging. Not only did Yahweh make them and make this entire world for them, but he put them apart. He made a garden for them, the Bible says. Somebody say garden. He made a garden for them to call home, a place that they could talk with him face to face. He made a special place in space. Okay? He made space for them. But he also made a special place for them in time. In what? Time. time. What was the place he made for them in time? Garden was the place he made for them in space. What was the place he made for them in time? Sabbath. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, have you preach next time. <laughs> Everybody say the Shabbat. 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 The rest. He pulled aside time and said, this time is special for us. Or on this time, you won't be able to go through a week without remembering that we are about relationship, that we belong together. The garden was the place where they lived and they saw God every day and he talked with them and they knew physically that they belonged with God. The Shabbat is the time where they came together every week and stopped everything else and just remembered that they belonged with God. And the enemy tried to take both from them. Ever ask yourself where the church was in the garden? Church was there because God was there. The entire garden was the church. It was his place too. Their home was his home. It was Yahweh's home. But when they fell, they lost that. One of the saddest things ever is when God has to tell them, you guys can no longer come and be in the garden anymore. Because we can't relate face to face like that like we used to. Otherwise, like he told Moses, my glory will destroy you. You guys have rejected me. You guys said you don't want me to belong with you anymore. So they had to leave. But even though they left the garden, it's the thing I love about Yahweh. They never, they never, they never left Yahweh. I thought I'd get one amen from that. I should say this then. Even though they left the garden, Yahweh never left them. Amen. He stuck with them throughout all of history. Every time you see uh, them in trouble, it's Yahweh who comes to them. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But he finally came in the form of one they called Jesus. And he came specifically not... To all the people who already thought they were living in perfection. Already thought they were living in paradise. But he says, I have come to those who are the outcast. So I might draw them in. And the place that society had told, or the, 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 the people who society had told, you don't belong. Oh, you're sick. You don't belong with us. Oh, you ate the wrong thing. You don't belong with us. Oh, you have the wrong job. You don't belong with us. Oh, you believe in the wrong political party. You don't belong with us. Oh. I'm going to go stop before I get fired. But <laughs> he came into a society where the majority of the people have been told, you don't belong. You don't think right, act right, do right. And Jesus Christ, Yahweh, came in the flesh to let them know, no, you do belong. And he went to them and he sat at their parties. Now remember, these were people who like, you know, saw Jesus and immediately said, oh, all right, we're all good. They were still probably having some, you know, flawed ways. Yo, hey, Lord, you want to hit? No, that's cool, but thank you, Zacchaeus. We'll talk later. But he went to their parties. He sat with them. He embraced them. To the lepers, he touched them. 
them. He held them. Yahweh came as Yeshua, as Jesus, to let us know that we belong. That a relationship is all about who belongs to who, and we still belong with him. In fact, this is, this, is the, this is the full circle I find so beautiful. They were kicked out of the garden and said, you have to find another way. While Jesus Christ is laying there on a cross, bleeding out, they have a thug next to him. The Hebrew word for thief, or the Greek word for thief that they use, is a word not someone who breaks into your house and like steals stuff and sneaks out, but someone who beats you up, takes what you have, and then kicks you while you're down. Okay, straight up thug life. He was a bad dude. So bad that they condemned him to the worst penalty they had, the cross. And the thief is laying there. And they're both yelling insults until one of the thieves looks and he sees that this is no ordinary man. This is God incarnate come and he saw acceptance on Jesus' eyes. As the blood trickled down his face, he saw acceptance. And he said, you remember what he says, church? He says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus' response is beautiful. He says, surely I tell you the truth today. You what? You will be with me in where? Paradise. Now, do you know what the Greek word for paradise, what, what, what it's translated from? Paradiso. And paradiso is a transliteration of the Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word is the word for garden. So he's telling the thief, you will be with me back in the garden. The place we all got kicked out of. Guess what? Through me, you belong. Do I have any thieves in this house? Do I have any people who have kicked and screamed and done horrible things and feel you have the enemy constantly in your ear telling you, you don't belong. You, know, you could come into church and wear your best of law shirt, but we both know you don't belong. I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ came to let you know you belong. Amen. Yahweh is the God of the belonging. Somebody tell us you belong. Say, I belong. Louder. I know. Let the world know. I we belong because of Yahweh. We are His. Someone's calling the cops right now. <laughs> Ezekiel 37 27 says, My dwelling place is with them, and I am their God, and they are my people. That's what God says about us fallen, broken, us. He is our God. We belong to Him. I have time. I don't have time. I have time for a story, Monty. No? Okay. Story about a man who had a huge fight with his father. Huge. Told his father, I hope you die and don't want to see you anymore. I can't wait to get out of this stupid, small, podunk town. I'm going to the big city. I'm going to make myself something. And so he left. His father, there, sitting on the chair weeping slammed the door got on a bus and left town to make something of himself went to new york city actually started to make something of himself got a little money did everything he was big enough and old enough to do got a bunch of girlfriends went to a bunch of parties did all the things that people who are on their own for the first time do and said yeah yeah i don't need you constantly his father would come to him write him call him one time visited the city, said, son, just come home. Just come home for Christmas. And I said, no, I don't belong there. This is where I belong now. Well, as the years went by, he started realizing that all the stuff he had accumulated in his life, he still felt empty and hollow and broken. And he could go to a party with a thousand people, all dancing to the music, jumping up and down, but he still felt all alone. He goes back to his apartment one day, and there, sitting in front of the door, is his father. His father said, I just, I just felt I had to come one more time and beg you, let you know you can come home whenever you want. We love you. 
says, Dad, I've done too much. The whole town knows how I treated you. I don't think they'd invite me back. He said, please, son. He said, I'll tell you what. I'm going past the town for a business trip. I'll be taking the train. Talk to the people of the town. It was a small town. And if, if they're willing for me to stop by just to say hi, I will. Uh, to let me know so I can get off the train. There on the, the, the side of the road and the fence that leads up to the town, tie a white handkerchief, you know, the one that mom gave you. Tie that, and, and I'll see the handkerchief, and I'll know. So he's, um, a couple months later, he's on his trip. He's traveling along, and all the people in the front of the car are making this commotion. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And he's walking. He's not even facing the town. He can't even bear himself because he knows nothing's going to be there. He was too wrong. He was too bad. He's too much of a jerk. He's too evil to be accepted. And he, um, he looks at the man. The man's eyes are wide. He was staying in front of him, looking out, out the window. He says, what do you see? He's all, <laughs> so it's, it's the darndest thing. It's like everybody in town has tied their bed sheets to the sides of the fences and the trees. So I don't even know what this means. These people must be crazy. So do you have any idea? And with tears in his eyes, the man gets up. He says, I know exactly what that means. It means I'm home. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that Jesus Christ laid himself out on a cross to let you know that whatever you've done in him, you're home. Yeah. Finally, finally, Yahweh is the God of the seeking. And this is a continuation of what we've been talking about. <laughs> exactly. Martha's like, it's not dramatic enough, Pastor. Now get there. Do you feel it now? Deep in your souls? In Genesis 3, this is interesting. Uh, I won't take a lot of time to uh, paint it out, but when you get a chance, go to your Bibles to Genesis, the third chapter, and you'll see the serpent. And the serpent is there. Not yet. Give me, give me three minutes. Um, see, the, the, the code is when I say finally, he gets up in place. But like I'm so used to saying finally at the third point that, you know, so it's not his fault. It's my fault. It, um, the serpent is, is introduced. And it's, it's some interesting wordplay here. And I just want to point it out because I think it's interesting. I'm a geek for the Bible. I've been gone for almost a month. So you'll have to indulge me. Uh, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild creatures that Yahweh had made. Yahweh had made. God made the serpent. The God of the relationship made the serpent. Okay. And when we know who the serpent was, we understand what that means. God still wanted to have a relationship with the serpent. He wanted the serpent to know you can come home. You belong. But the serpent then said, said, did God really say? When he refers to God, he says, did Elohim really say? You see, the God who created the serpent is Jehovah. But when the serpent refers to God, it's always Elohim. This big, powerful, uh, faraway God really say that you can't eat the fruit. And Adam and Eve debate with him a little bit. And finally, he convinces Eve to reject Yahweh and choose Eve. And then they convince Adam to reject Yahweh and choose Adam. And their selfishness, they shut the door on God. And say, we don't want you more. We want us. Now they have just damned all of humanity. And God has to come to them. And he says, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And God has to come down to them. Now, what God do you think comes to them? In my mind, it would be Elohim. To come down and say, I created everything with my voice. I could wipe you out with my voice. Be like my dad used to tell me, I brought you in this world, boy. I can take you out. That's Elohim dad right there. But God doesn't come as Elohim. Look at this. Verse 8 says, The man and his wife heard the sound of Yahweh. As he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from Yahweh among the trees. They messed up. They were naked. They blasphemed his name and brought shame upon himself. But he goes searching for them. He calls to them when they've cut him off. 
to give them an opportunity to welcome him back in. And when they blame him, he blesses them. And when he says, you have to leave the garden, he provides a sacrifice to let them know that he will always be with them. He's Elohim, the God who seeks. And since that moment, God has always been seeking and saving the lost, going after those who have run away from him. It's Elohim that comes to Noah and says, I'm going to save the world through you. It's Elohim that goes to Abraham after he's taken Sarah or Haggai as his wife, slept with her, ignored God. It's Elohim that comes and says, I still have a covenant for you. When Jacob lies to his father and cheats his brother and is running for his life and feels like I can never go back again, who comes to Jacob and says, I'm with you? It's Elohim. He says, You belong. And Jacob wakes up and says, surely the Lord was in this place. And surely the Lord was in this place. And I didn't know it. It's Elohim. All throughout history, whenever one of us falls, it's Elohim that comes every time and tells us we belong. When Moses was abandoned in the desert. It was Elohim that came to Moses and said, we're going to go set my people free. He says, well, who's that? Should I tell them sent me? He says, you tell them. It was Elohim. And when Jesus Christ is with the Pharisees and Sadducees and they're telling him, you don't belong. He says, before Abraham was, I am Elohim. I've come to seek and to save the lost. And if you've been running, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to someone in the sound of my voice. You've been running and you've been running and you've been running. You've shut your ears off. Hiding from God saying, I don't think he wants me anymore. I've got good news for you. Now where you've gone. Now what you've done. He still seeks you. Stop trying to reach you. When we talk about God being the God who sits at the right hand of the Father, we talk about God being the God who uh, fights for us. That's Elohim, Jesus Christ. Every time we fall, every time we've run away, he says, Dad, I'm going to go get him. I'm going to bring him home. I don't know if you've seen the video. It's a classic one. It's of a sheep. And it's gotten itself stuck in a culvert and there's water coming. Culvert's like a, like a little small valley area. Steep, side, too steep. It's got up as far as it can, but it can't get any more. And man sees the sheep and he goes down and he tries to get it. He's going to lasso it and pull it up. But every time the sheep sees him, it gets scared and it runs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheep sounds. And man keeps going after him. And now the man, you see, he's exhausted. He's trugging through mud. The rain is starting to come. The water's coming. The man himself is in danger. But he doesn't give up. He keeps going. He keeps going. Finally gets the rope around the sheep. And the sheep is bucking and kicking and trying to get away. The water's coming. It's raising. It's now up to the man's thighs. The sheep will soon be too heavy, dragged down by the wool in the water. But the sheep is still trying to get away until finally, finally, the sheep looks around and realizes there's nowhere it can go. And it just slumps over and allows the man to hold it and pull it inch by inch to safety. How many sheep do we have in here that are still fighting and running? But God is doing everything he can to pull you in and to save you. If you've been running today and you're tired of running, I've got good news for you. You can stop. Just turn around and embrace 
Elohim because he's right there for you. Isaiah 41, 13 says this. For I am Elohim, your God. I've taken hold of your right hand, the past tense. I'm holding you. It says, I do not fear the present tense. I am with you. And he says, I will help you, the future tense. He is a God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is a God of the relationship. Won't you let Elohim come to you today?
anyone today who's been running who needs to see that you are with them that you're still there please let your spirit come to them right now free them to be with you this is our prayer in Jesus name amen every single time 